please take a moment for silent reflection or prayer. Murray. 
Madam President, members of the board, <clears throat> just recommended the governing board approve an increase of 10 cents to school lunch prices for the fiscal year 2019-2020. There will be there will be no increase to the school breakfast price. Governing board is asked to approve an increase to school lunch prices to become effective in the 1920 school year. The USD requires that there is equity in school lunch pricing, a provision that requires school districts to charge students for paid meals at a price that is on average equal to the distance. The difference between free meal reimbursement of $3.39 and the paid meal reimbursement of $0.39, cents, which is a difference of $3. Uh, schools that currently charge less for meal prices than the amount needed to create paid lunch equity are required to gradually increase prices over time until they meet the requirement or supplement their food service operating funds with non-federal funds to ensure equity. So the prices uh, are below there um, for you to see. 1819, that's this current fiscal year's um, prices, and then 1920s proposed. You can see the difference of uh, 10 cents in the elementary lunch price and in the middle and high school lunch price. You can also see that uh, we are at $2.50 for elementary and $2.75, still under the $3.00. Um, target, so that's why we are gradually increasing meal prices um, at 10 cents to try to uh, catch up to that, that amount over time. Any discussion? I move we approve 6.1 as presented. Is there a second? I second. I didn't want Archie to go left out. <laughs> <laughs> so we have no choice in must increase our school lunch prices over in the USDA gradually over time. And that's why we, we chose 10 cents just as a gradual uh, movement at that scale up towards that, that average price. Now that can increase next year. So we would get that $3 mark may continue to, to climb. And if we still fall short of that, we need to gradually increase prices to try to get to that point at some, at some future, future date. recommended the governing board approve the appointment of Mrs. Marcia Cox and Mr. Hal Christensen to the Employee Benefit Trust of Trustees, effective July 1st, 2019. Arizona Re Revised Statute 15-382C specifies trustees are appointed by the governing board and then if a, an employee of the school district is acting as a trustee, the trust shall be administered by at least five joint trustees, of whom no more than one may be an employee of the school district. Both Mrs. Cox and Mr. Christensen have previously served on the EBT Trust Board and were the only two applicants to apply for the two open positions. Employee Benefit Trust Board of Trustee terms are three years. Therefore, the trust membership would, if approved, be as follows. And you can see the five members of the, the board listed there with their expiration dates. Any discussion? I move we approve 6.2 as presented. I, I would just like to add to that, it's really nice to have people with Mrs. Cox's experience and a knowledge of the history of the changes we've made in the ABT, and especially since she's been so instrumental in, in making them. So it's just nice to know that we will have you to continue to serve on the board. All right. I, I, I agree with that, but I also wanted to say I appreciate um, whoever sent out the applications because I think that was important especially for the board members that will be here longer um, to see you know what some of the qualifications are um, okay. as they're looking forward you know so I hope that will be a normal thing every time we have a new uh, person apply to be a trustee that the board will see that whole application uh, so they can make that determination and yes thank you to Marcia and how both Everybody, Amy, sitting out there, everybody who's sitting on that trust is doing a good job. Very transparent. We love that. Mrs. Fleming. 
John Hanson? Yes. Archana Elyar? Yes. Go Cohen? Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> yes. Item 6.3, Mr. Murray. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the governing board approve resolutions number 2019-2001 through 2019-2010. The action described in the, in the recommendation is necessary to continue our current practices through the 2019-2020 fiscal year. The resolutions as submitted are maintenance resolutions and will not affect any substantial change in our current operating procedures. Okay. Is there a motion? I move that we, that we accept the 6.3 as presented. A second? I'll second. All right. Any discussion? Mrs. Fleming? Archana Elliar? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. 6.4, Mrs. Asire. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. It is recommended that the governing board approve the attached uh, two-year memorandum of understanding between Hospice of Havasu and the Lake Havasu Unified School District from July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2021. Approval of this memorandum of, of understanding will enable the Lake Havasu Unified School District to provide much-needed grief support when necessary. Hospice of Havasu will provide these services at no cost to LHUSD, and this memo um, has been previously approved by the board. I move that we approve 6.4 as presented. I second. Any discussion? Well, we just, I just got the curriculum, like a, a detailed look at the curriculum. So I'm going to look at it for, for next year. Submit my suggestions well in advance. Okay. <laughs> but thank you for requesting that for me. I appreciate it. All right. <coughs> Mrs. Fleming? John Baston? Yes. Archana Elder? Yes. Debbie Cox? Yes. Uh, 6.5. Mr. Becker? Or Mr. Murray? Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the governing board approve the intergovernmental agreement IGA between Lake Havis Unified School District and Mojave Community College for dual enrollment courses. Dual enrollment provides high school juniors and seniors with not only high school credit, which count toward high school graduation, but with college credits while they are enrolled in high school. High school students will be able to take MCC courses using MCC curricula and textbooks. Classes will be taught at the high school during the school day by qualified high school instructors who are employed at the Kevinster High School. Dual enrollment provides free college tuition for high school students who are able to take these classes and makes it possible for graduating high school senior to have completed at least one year's worth of college credit by the end of his or her high school career, thus saving the student both time and money. This agreement has been reviewed and approved by the district's legal counsel as to form. Uh, I did add a, a note on here after talking to legal counsel that it is contingent on the county attorney's approval of the IGA without revision. Uh, you'll recall last year, or actually earlier this year, this school year, we came to you like in August or September, if I remember right, with the school year already started with this um, act, asking for an action to approve the IGA. This time we're on the front end of this, um, so we're bringing it to the board before they do. So we just want to add in there the contingency that they don't make any changes to this. If they if they approve it as to form, It'll then, come back. then you're okay. But if they change it, I'll have to come back and, I, and point that out to you. Um, any other discussion or questions? I move that we approve 6.5 as presented. I second it. All right. And then are we able to um, to see, I, I know that we talked about this last year, but can we see the textbooks? Can we have access to the textbooks that are being taught in class? The board? Yeah, there just for, certainly. Just to review, just to see what they're doing? They, they're after the textbooks at MCC. I know. Uses for those for those classes. Right. I just yeah. want to see what they are because okay. when we approve it, we're approving the textbooks okay. that they use. Yeah. So I'd like to see the okay. textbooks. I'm not going to. No, I know what you mean. I, just, I want to, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to say something about dual enrollment. Uh, I, I wish more people knew about it and more students could take advantage of it. It's really a wonderful opportunity to see 
students graduate from high school and often they go over to MCC and they get their two-year certificate before they actually get their high school certificate uh, diploma at, at high school graduation, which is you know, kind of what you want. And then, uh, so now they've already got two years of college out of the way, and then you run into them and their parents in a couple of years and they just graduated from college and they now enter a master's program. I mean, it's just, it's just how can you lose with, with that? It's, it's just a wonderful thing. I'm so glad we're able to offer that here. Is this one? Uh, can I, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? The only question I have is it says qualified high school instructor, and I'd like to know what a qualified high school instructor for the moment entails in this day and age. So that has changed over the course, <laughs> and we are on year two of five years where our teachers have the ability to make corrections to their certificates to teach at the high school. They're certified through ADE and, and they meet the criteria to be a, a high school teacher in, in the public school system. And to teach at the collegiate level, there's a different accreditation that takes place for those teachers. Um, the rules kind of changed a few years ago and so we had to revisit things and to be a qualified teacher at the end of the five years, you have to have a master's in your program that you are teaching. So if you're teaching math, you have to have a master's in math, not just a master's in, in place. It has to be in that subject area for those qualified people. Um, we have one person on the high school campus that does have a master's, they have their MBA, and we we teach a business class, or she does, mm -hmm. teaches a business class, and the others are on that probation, probationary time. With that being said, though, a few of them teach at MCC night classes as well. So it's not um, the high school just selecting teachers and putting them in place. They're, they're being highly noted at, the, at MCC as well to teach classes for them. Um, as we've had teachers retire, <coughs> We used to have dual enrollment Spanish, and as we had teachers retire within that five-year time period, we're not selecting new teachers to fall into that position, and they're not approving them. So we've lost dual enrollment Spanish and dual enrollment biology um, over the past few years, which we have replaced dual enrollment biology with AP biology moving forward, planning for the future that this possibly could come to an end at Lake Emerson High School. We also, if I may mention, we've met with the leadership at MCC and we are um, struggling just as much as we are in terms of having those qualifications. And so uh, that has been one of the concerns is that we are losing our dual movement classes because we don't have teachers who are qualified to teach them. And so according to the college's requirements, it's something that we're aware of. Is that, is that MCC's requirement or is that a state requirement? That's the community college district system. I believe, I, I, I don't want to, I'll speak on record obviously, but I believe it's national. It's not just the state of Arizona. So this is a problem that's going to sweep from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast that for schools that do offer this on our campuses. And my sister-in-law is a teacher and their kid is going into high school next year and they are going to a specific high school because it offers this. And I said, be very careful because here's what's going on. And, and they were made well aware of that going into high school as well. So it's not just the Lake Havasu MCC. Actually, MCC I recall that in California as well. Yes. You're right. Okay. Um, just a question on the textbook list. So we actually have included the textbooks that are used in these courses on our textbook list that we brought to the board in the house. Um, so it's, Unless the books change, which sometimes occurs, uh, most of those are on the textbook list. Are you requesting that a copy of each of them be provided here at the boardroom for you, board review, or to? Yeah, I would like to look at the actual books. I know that we were presented that list, but that requires me to go purchase the book in order. Right. To or I guess my question was versus going to the high school to look at. I'd rather have them here. It would be nice to if there was. If we could have a set here just to look, it doesn't have to stay here, but I, yeah, it's hard to get to the high school. Yes, it's it's hard to get around anywhere in the high school right now. So I can't promise that this is going to be done by the end of June. Friday is my last day, so that I can take a little vacation, um, and then a lot of 
construction and whatnot is taking place at high school as well. So I cannot even get into some of those buildings that house those folks at this time. I will try to get what I can. It's not urgent. It, okay. it, it can be after your bathroom vacation. Okay. <laughs> It's not for this year, but I would like to see, have an idea, look at the text. I've looked at a lot of the text for my year, so. But my question, I, a question that developed was, when I remember looking at the list, I don't know if that was in something that Terry sent, the <coughs> dual enrollment attached to this, was there an attachment with this action item that you emailed to us? Yes, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the IG. Okay, so. yeah. Um, it seemed to me that there was some courses on there that weren't like, what I would think of as a normal <coughs> college course, more like career courses. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? You I have the list. Yeah, you have to yeah. um, Design one, intro to business entertainment. I think that's in business enterprise. Okay, okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking. That doesn't. I meant Sanitation and safety. Uh, English composition one, history of US one, college map, mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. algebra, okay. effective leadership, intro to culinary. Yeah. English Comp 2, Anatomy and Physiology, History of um, US 2, Plain Trigonometry, and Intro to Statistics. So yes, there are so there are a lot, you know, more than a couple that aren't just regular, you know, English, History, AP, Biology, and all not all of those are, are going to have taught at high school right now. They, they've been in the past and they stay on that IGA, so they're a choice, just like our student course handbook. Once a course is approved, it stays there as an option for our students in the future. <coughs> Anything else? So for myself, I was just thinking there's not going to be textbooks for all those courses. That's true. Yes. I understand that. <coughs> all right. Thank you. Terry? John Maston? Yes. Nicole Cullen? Yes. Jan Elliott? Yes. Kevin <coughs> Fox? Yes. Item 6.6, .6, uh, Mrs. Festinagel. <coughs> Are you still there? I'm still here, and uh, just so you know, there's a presentation to go with this, so, but I'll call me uh, the action item first. Madam President and Governing Board, it is recommended that the Board approve changes to the LAQSD Teacher Evaluation and Growth System as a result of legislative changes and guidelines, as well as staff received from administration and certified staff. Changes have been made to the formal evaluation tool was developed in alignment with ARS 15 by 37. This system was created with the philosophy that ongoing data should be gathered, teacher expectations should be clear and equitable from school to school, quality feedback and systems that support are essential to improve teacher practice. Teacher reflection is a key component to improving performance over their careers, and the teacher's role is to work with students to support their learning. The updated tool features a walkthrough instrument that will give evaluators data to support specific indicators on the evaluation tool. The evaluation tool also streamlines forms for teachers and evaluators and clearly lays out timelines and requirements of expectations. The tool sets the overall evaluation from seven standards to five propositions. The tool is aligned to LAQSD professional development and best practices. So both principals and teachers are able to focus their attention on effective teaching and learning. The system presented today includes suggested additions, adjustments, and refinements from committee members and administration. A copy of the teacher evaluation was sent electronically. There have been a couple of revisions uh, that should be on your desk um, that were made um, that are fixed. Is there a motion to approve 6.6? Do you want to see the PowerPoint first or the presentation first? Sure. Okay. So, Abby, I think I'm counting on you to click for me. So, just stop me at any time if there's questions. Um, Abby, if you'll go to the second slide of the committee member. Yes, there. Okay. So, uh, this evaluation system was created uh, over the past six months. We, uh, as a committee and with administration, decided that we did not want to move toward an evaluation system that was just um, off the shelf, like many school districts do. We felt that we needed one that was specific to our schools and our needs. And so I just want to commend the work of the evaluation committee because this was more work than any of us knew we were getting into. 
um, and it really, uh, they've worked extremely hard. The committee really represents different perspectives from across schools, grades, subjects, uh, who are the students that they teach, and so we really wanted to make sure that this is an evaluation system that all teachers and all students benefited from. And how can you click? And so when we're looking at an evaluation system, we really wanted to keep two things in mind. Knowing that most teachers are effective in their practices, how do we continue to grow and improve their practice? And so all throughout their career, there's something that they're working on. They're getting better and we're really not having this level of stagnant state. And then at the same time, when we want to grow teachers, we also need to be able to identify underperforming teachers and either fix what their issues are or we need to support them into um, not teaching our students. And so our evaluation has to do two different, very different things is, you know, improve teaching and then really identify what quality teaching looks like. And we were really mindful that we're really looking at a year three, which is when they move from probationary to continuing status. We really wanted to make sure that they have all those skills so that we know that once we have teachers that are at continuing status, we know that we have those quality teachers in the classroom. And if you'll click again, and so really thinking about some of the issues with our last evaluation tool is it was um, very lengthy. There was all sorts of pieces that were not aligned. There were pieces in the evaluation system that frankly were just not, they're just not effective practices. Um, and then we really want to, to make sure that our walkthrough instruments that principals are using when they walk into a classroom and see the evaluation before the two systems really were separate. We had different schools using different lesson plans, and so we really wanted to streamline that everything we were doing was easy to access, easy for the principal, easy for the teacher, and there was just a streamlined workflow for the evaluators. And you'll click again, and so there should be a graph uh, chart in front of you. And this was really thinking about what, how can our evaluation improve teaching and so really so those first teachers as we hire them they've got uh, the attitudes that we want they're committed to our kids but then slowly over time in those first couple years we're supporting them by teaching them the strategies that we want them to use we're showing them good models um, that they're at some point they're learning these models and then they're applying those models um, and they're thinking about those things as we teach. And so we really developed this in our lesson plan um, of, what, of what good teaching looks like. And then as teachers grow, um, they're able to innovate and advance the, the profession. So those highly effective teachers, they in turn become the mentors and the teachers for the next group of teaching. And then Aggie, if you'll click, the next slide shows what the evaluation looks like, and, and there's three parts to each of us, is the indicator, um, and so we have the proposition, which is just the language that we use for the categories, um, and so thinking what are these three categories of what we're expecting teachers to be able to do, and then we get into the specifics with the indicators, so the indicators describe specific skills um, that teachers will be able to accomplish. And there's multiple indicators that make up the proposition. And then we have the look for. The look for are just a guide. They're not a checklist. They're just something that both teachers and evaluators can look for. That so these are the things that I'm looking for that tell me that the teacher is able to do this set of skills or complete these tasks. And then if you'll click to the next page, which is the classroom observation increment. Prior to this, we used the Teach for Success model, and there's many good things about it, but it just wasn't quite aligned to our evaluation system. It was really just one piece of it, but this really takes all of the pieces um, of the teaching and the learning in a classroom. Um, so this really 
is able to, as in watching the skills that we're, we're needing for you to do for effective instruction, we're then seeing, am I, am I seeing this? And so this is going to be able to give principals um, and evaluators just stronger data when they're really thinking about what the teaching looks like in that classroom. And then real quick again, we uh, created a lesson plan template. This was, we actually had a lesson plan template this year, um, and we just simplified it a little bit moving forward. But this way, when teachers turn in the lesson plan for the evaluation, it will be the same no matter what school you're at. It's based on my smokers work, um, and it's David Barry Madeline Hunter based, which is um, uh, really a direct style of instruction that we know that works. The other thing that we see is there's check for understanding. There's assessment all the way through. So teachers are gathering data about whether students are getting it and whether we can move on. And so we're really excited about this new evaluation, uh, sorry, new lesson plan. Anything, anything else you're going to add? Go ahead. Um, the self-reflection uh -huh. the next key is professional goal. So um, we are having teachers be self-reflective on their skills and think about what skills um, they need to add. And so we know that this is really the key to teacher growth throughout their career. Um, so even if you're someone that's teaching for 20 years, thinking about what in my practice do, can I still work on? And, and for, for sure the teacher, that keeps us learning. Um, and the same thing for the professional goal, it's tied to the evaluation um, and the skills in it, and so teachers, um, it's focused. Um, and then if you'll click the next page, this is just a guide for the evaluators, letting them know how many times based on someone's score, you're going to go into a classroom. Um, and this really is the same that we had in our old evaluation tool, but we just laid it out so it's really easy for evaluators to know that information. The evaluation rating, 80% um, of the school uh, evaluation is based on classroom performance, and then this is by statute. The other 20% is based on student growth measures. The 10% is growth from pre to post test, and 10% letter grade. Now what that 20% is, we decided as a school district, um, that's what we proposed um, based on student growth measures. So thinking about what a teacher does inside in their classroom and then collectively um, as a school. And then the last slide, our next step after approval is digitizing the evaluation tool and frontline, um, providing training for administrators, training for teachers. Next year, we'll develop a highly effective teacher instrument, which is in statute, but we needed to roll this out first and then continue to refine our practices as tools. Cool. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve this item? I make a motion that we approve 6.6. .6. I'll second it. All right, uh, any discussion? Um, I just want to be clear on, because the pages that are here, that you said that there were some changes made, um, I don't know what those are, because... Oh. Did, you, did, you did you hear that, Jamie? Um, my mic's not on. I, I'm not really clear on the changes. Terry put, paper, I believe Terry put these on our desk. Um, for Proposition 1 and Proposition 5, but, yeah. it, but it doesn't indicate what was changed, and so, and then I have a couple of questions. So there's okay. that. I don't know if you want me to ask them all, because maybe you might answer them all in one. Um, the second question is, going from this, where you have the Propositions 1 through 5, but then to the Observation Instrument, how did you determine, was that just your committee that determined which one to use for the observation piece? So the propositions one and five are things that you can't necessarily see walking into a classroom. So it's 
how you know your professionalism, how you speak with parents. And so that isn't something that because I go into a classroom and I watch the teacher teach, it's not as visible. And so the walkthrough instrument is really what is visible. So also um, the ones that we have on planning instruction, if I'm a, a evaluator, although I can assume what's planned and not planned, I really can't see that without seeing a teacher's lesson plan book and knowing what that looks like. And so the observation tool, the ones that were selected, are simply the visible things that you can see within a classroom. Okay. That makes sense. And then do you want me to share what was changed? If you could, yes, please. I, yes. And so if you look at uh, Proposition 1.1, in the highly effective category, what what the last bullet used to say teachers empower students to advocate for themselves when their needs are not being met. And it was changed to creating a teacher creates a class environment where students are comfortable advocating for themselves when their learning needs are not being met. So really focusing on, you know, we're giving students that room to say, I can't see the board. Can you repeat that again? So just really making sure that we're tying it down okay. that they're learning needs. And, and then, I'm sorry, there right. was a typo in that document. There. Oh, sorry. Yes, I won't fix it. I apologize. I did that um, in a meeting today very quickly. And then um, for 1.3, uh, we removed out of the title equity, and so it's creating an optimal learning environment of respect and rapport, and just making sure that we knew as a committee what we were talking about with equity, um, but not everybody shares that and not everybody knows that, and so really when we're focused on making sure that all students are valued and all students are included, and so that piece of the title um, wasn't it wasn't needed and it didn't add anything. Um, our focus really is on just making sure that the teacher is mindful of all of their students. Okay. And then for um, five and five point three, showing professionalism. Again, that highly effective this day. Teacher makes a concerted effort challenge negative attitudes or practices is what it used to say. That was pretty negative. Um, and instead focusing on teacher is being positive and um, aligning themselves with the district mission and vision. And so rather than having teachers challenge other teachers um, for what they believe are negative practices, being involved with yourself um, and aligning you know, your practices Okay. Thank you. Any help? Thank you. Um, couple, one, well, two more points or questions. So, is there a specific under uh, 2.4 leveraging knowledge of content and pedagogy? Pedagogy, however you say that word, um, utilizes research based strategies. So I've been researching research and trying to figure out what evidence is versus research based versus scientific. So, and you're not probably gonna be able to answer this question right now and that's fine, but I would like to be clear on what all those terms mean and how we're using them within our school district. Because when I'm out trying to research, it's very difficult, like I have, um, this one document that I use that talks about scientifically based research versus evidence based practices and instruction and and it goes on from there it's pretty engrossed but it uses different language than research based strategies so I just want to be clear on the terminology so maybe I could get help offline for that yeah and um, that is just so important and something, you know, we spent the year, we, we went to John Hattie um, and as part of this and really thinking 
about. There are there are things that I know and I love because it's my favorite lesson that I've done in my class forever and ever. Um, because I really like making posters of whatever, but it's not actually a, a effective. And so, um, but I understand your point. We we've been as teachers really pushed through a whole research phase. Um, but I think that's a good point. Um, and certainly we do want teachers to use things that we know um, support students and they're not it's not just their favorite thing and their favorite trick. Or new theory. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. This is a lot of work. And so I'm appreciative to everybody that did all that work because I know that was a lot. I read the last one word for word, the last evaluation, and it was it was a mess. This is really good. <laughs> and I, I think if um, Mrs. Bessa Dable isn't going to share, but she spent a whole lot of time organizing, and then everybody who was on the committee spent hours and hours and hours. They worked on their own, they worked on weekends, refining and refining. So this tool um, it truly was, when she says it's a six month effort, but it was a six month effort with a lot of time spent on it, not just right. once a month meetings. Sure, it shows. Yeah, it does. Anybody else? I, I myself am thrilled to see the guided practice put back in to, to lesson design and checking for understanding I mean, objective and scaffolding. I think that, that was always there, but I feel like we, we got away from le lesson design, and I, which I happen to be a big believer in, and that is Madeline Hunter, but uh, which is research-based. Um, but I uh, thank you for, for doing that, because I think a teacher, when she realizes at the end of the day, grading homework, whatever, that the students didn't do well, all you have to do is go back and say, what did I leave out of the, of, of the lesson design? And uh, you, you know what you did. I mean, you just didn't do that. You didn't do a good job, or you didn't have your objective, uh, and your independent practice weren't connected in a very good way. And it's, it's a real easy way to find out what your kids didn't do well. So I'm very appreciative of that. And again, I, I want to echo the rest of the board and Mrs. Assire about how much work obviously went into this. Raise your hand. Uh, I, I see three of you out there. Raise your hand if you were on this committee. I can hold them. Okay. <laughs> okay, all of you. Here, here, here. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully this is it, and then you, you, you hit the mark here. You didn't just take a cookie cutter. Yeah. <laughs> Out of curiosity, um, I wonder if Mike has any idea how much money we received for uh, the unfunded man tape that requires this. <laughs> to date? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well then, uh, Mrs. Fleming. Marchana Elliar? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Masters? Yes. Kathy Fox? Yes. And again, thank you, Mrs. Festadagle, and mm -hmm. the committee for all of your hard work. Um, thank you all. Mm -hmm. Item 6.7, Mr. Murray. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the governing board approve a contract for accounting services between Kelly Morrison and the Lake Havas Unified School District to be effective. July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. The district received two responses, uh, two quotes for accounting services. They're listed there in your action item. Uh, $25 an hour uh, plus travel expenses for Kelly. Professional group at $100 an hour plus travel expenses. And then three additional requests for quotes. Uh, we did not receive a response. Uh, but we did receive one just the other day. After this was submitted, that was at $200 an hour. So Kelly Morrison is a former accounting specialist of the Lake Unified School District. She just had to relocate to another state uh, earlier this year. Uh, she continues to play an important role in our financial uh, software migration. Uh, the rate of pay listed in the contract is $25 per hour, not to exceed $60,000 annually, and that does include uh, any exp expenses associated with travel. Um, that rate of pay is calculated or was determined uh, that not to exceed was determined uh, to be $25 an hour times eight hours a day, 
times 261 days uh, a year. That's just assuming she never takes a day off for a vacation. Um, so it's, it's enough to exceed 60,000 just so we don't have to come back before the board later in the year. Is there a motion? I move that we approve 6.7 as presented. Second. Okay. Discussion? Mr. Murray, is Kelly the gal that straightened out a lot of our issues with reconciliation? She is. I hear that we had roughly three individuals over less than a two year period in that position, and then Kelly mm -hmm. was hired. And she's been with us um, for a couple of years now. And so definitely the turnover prior to her being here did not help the district at all uh, as far as reconciling with the county. And we've made tremendous, <coughs> tremendous gains with her stability and expertise. So yes, to answer your question, she is definitely instrumental in doing that. And how does she interface with the district? Our system is uh, web-based, so uh, our software system that we upgraded this last year, uh, she's able to utilize that wherever she is. Um, so where she is now currently in another state, she's able to uh, get on a computer just like we are here and access the same uh, portal and logins uh, that we uh, utilize here. And she's Whether she's sitting in a, in a room here in this building or where she is in another state, um, it's the same. We just don't get to see her face as often. <laughs> And the $25 an hour, that is uh, all-inclusive. So she's paying for her own benefits, her own FICA tax. Correct. And that's, and that's uh, I'm, I'm assuming, because she's the one that, that presented that quote, I'm assuming that she's taking all of that into account on her, on her end. So if you look at, if we were to hire someone in that position, which it's historically has been really difficult to do, um, that same pay structure would be pretty equivalent to if we were to hire someone and have them housed here in a full-time capacity. Anything else? I think it's a real honor to have a former uh, employee of the district um, be offered, you know, a, this kind of job. I think it speaks to the work that she did in the department because I haven't heard of anybody being able to do this in our district since I've been sitting on the board. So I think it speaks to her level of work. She's a nice lady. She was very helpful to through that transition, I remember. So I think it's great. Is this Lane? Paul Cohen? Yes. John Maston? Yes. Archana Aliar? Yes. <coughs> Kathy Fox? Yes. I'm 6.7. I'm sorry. I'm 6.8. Uh, Mrs. Walter. Madam President, Mr. Ford, it is recommended the Governing Board approve the Memorandum of Understanding between Havasu Community Health Foundation and the Cap Unified School District for the Student Assistance Program, known as SAP, for the 2019-20 school year. The Memorandum establishes a formal commitment between the parties to support collaborative work in better addressing the behavioral and social needs of our at students through the Student Assistance Program in all our elementary schools with the intent of providing services in the middle and high schools of opportunity and time permit. Havasu Community Health Foundation agrees to administer and provide the student assistance program to support the elementary schools. And the district agrees to provide $20,000 in funding to supplement the wage of the student assistance program coordinator. This program was previously supported through an interagency. Funding will come from the 291 Medicaid funds. This has been reviewed for purchasing and by legal. The agreement is attached for your review and will be presented annually for renewal. And just so you know, the SAP program is an evidence-based program. I move we approve 6.8 as presented. Second. Discussion? I do have questions about those things. Sire answered those for me. I appreciate that. And, um, Mrs. Fleming? Wait, we are going to, we, we did make we are updating it before we sign it. Yes, we have a the signed copy has uh, replaced the word area. Okay. 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 All right. John Maston? Yes. Archie Anna Elliar? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Kathy Cox? Yes. Item 6.9. Um, Mrs. Assigner. Thank you. 
these are um, items that were requested to be brought back for board discussion. And so the first of three policies that we're bringing forward is the policy <coughs> R-R student records regarding directory information. So it is our recommendation that the governing board discuss and it agreed upon a pre revisions to the regulation on student records for directory information. I do want to share that the policy JRR lists the maximum information that may be released as directory information pursuant to federal law, and those are listed on pages three and four of the policy. Each district governing board must approve that list of information that the district will release as directory information, and so you do have flexibility to reduce the list, um, but not to enlarge the list. So let's stop. Where, where is the directory house? How did I come across it? So this is, um, is referred to as directory information, but it is the uh, information that is released from our student, sir, uh, our student system, uh, Synergy, mm -hmm. upon request. And the, I appreciate Mr. Becker did some research for us as well. But the main um, organizations who request directory information are the Board of Regents for colleges and the military. Mm -hmm. So those are the two main requesters. Mm -hmm. And then if we publish things like the uh, honor roll list, or we publish students' pictures and things like that, those are also considered directory information. So. I move the open discussion on item 6.9. Mm -hmm. Yes. Second. Uh, there are, there's a lot there's a lot on here. We go through the letter N on what we're allowed to release. Um, I look at things like the student's telephone listing or date and place of birth, electronic uh, mail address, uh, major field of study, dates of attendance, um, enrollment status, whether it's full time or part time, students participate. Uh, no. Uh, and then the students most uh, recently attended educational agency or institution. Are those things that you really need to be able to give the military or college on a student? Do you want me to, I, can, I can address this. So, well, we all got the list, right? Right. Well, actually, I am related to those. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't realize I haven't hit. <laughs> My apologies. I have the special list. Oh, okay. Scott. Oh, you do? Yeah. So, would you I didn't like, get the special list. Would you like me to start with the military and what we released to them? Yes. Okay. So what we released to the military is the student's name, mm -hmm. the student's grade that they're enrolled in, the gender, their date of birth, their parents' address, their parents' phone number, and their parent email. And that's what the military gets from us. It's a separate query that we run in our student management system and provide that to the military upon request. So, some of the things that are listed in policy, because they're on that list, just as stated, we do not release all of that um, to the military. The Board of Regents, uh, that list is we release the student's name, the student's address, the student's email, which is the, our HAPSU online account, it's not their personal email account, um, that all of our students um, have at the high school. That is also a safety measure that's at the high school, put in place for both the high school and the students. There are a list of words that are triggered on their email when they submit from that. Guns, suicide, things, school shootings, things of that nature. When those happen in that email setting, when they're submitting assignments to teachers, it goes through that and it will send the principal of that site an email immediately where that triggers a conversation for me to be had with the student or I can go through and say this is part of the assignment or the essay that they're they're going through. I know that's a side note to that, but that's that's one of the, our, our safe elements that we have with the have to online account. Um, going on with the list, the student's date of birth, the parent's email, um, the parent's phone number, and then the parent's address, both, both the physical and the um, mail address is submitted to the Board of Regents. <coughs> So after looking at the, that list, thank you for giving us that. Um, my question is, um, why does the military require less information than the Puerto Ricans? <laughs> <laughs> that I have the answer to. Is the NSA involved? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so this is what we're required to send to the Board of Regents. Yes, and that has been paired back because I believe this was a topic of conversation a year or two ago where this was brought forward and this list was pared down at that time and what they were requesting they did not get because we paired down this list as well. And I do not recall what those things were. I don't either, but it sounds vaguely familiar. Um, well, I just find that interesting that the military requires less than a state university would, or the system, the university system would. So what happens if we curve down our list again and say we're not giving more than we're giving the military? <laughs> Do our kids not get into college? <laughs> I, you know, I don't. I think really the only, and I, I just can't my list off, but I think the main difference is the student's email address, which is actually we don't provide the student's email address. We provide a district email address right. for that student. So technically, it isn't the student's email address. Um, I guess that's and then the, they both uh, and then the parents phone number is the other the item that's on that list. What about athletic scholarships and for uh, athletes? Um, for for that, our athletes have to go on the the NCAA clearinghouse. Yeah. And so we don't provide that. Okay. No, 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 you you have to you have to pay the fee to NCAA and and uh, NAIA if you're so so inclined. Okay. Well, this might be a, a good time for um, Mr. Madison to announce that his son has a, <laughs> a scholarship, and uh, I think that's really big news. He did. He did very well in the uh, in the scholarship and grant pool. So he he's going to go to Blackburn College uh, in Illinois, and he has got uh, his college pretty much paid for for four years at that private school. So, you may play a little baseball out there as well. <laughs> well congratulations. So, uh, anything else to add, Mr. Becker? Uh, no, I'm, I mean, obviously here to answer questions on, okay. on any of them as well. Any more questions? So, I just want to understand the process. So, <laughs> since we only do it for Board of Regents and military, everybody else is, all the other requests are, I would, individual or our students are saying you know directed if you want to participate you need to go out and do it yourself so well, and this that we provide the media things like that which would be included in some of these other areas sure right okay. sure um local media right correct so the email is the only thing and for the military they only ask for the parents address or at regions once the students address and the parents address. I don't know what they're assuming there, but so if we just took out the student's email, what would that do? Because I think that's the difference between the two is the email, but I think the difference is that the military is not trying to go to the students without involving the parents. That's what I see. And the universities, so how do the parents all know all the communication that the universities are having about all their free money and how they can go to college for free and, you know, how easy it is and, well, you know, go talk to your counselor if that's all bypassing the parents because it's going to the student have to online account. I don't know. So I'm wondering what that process is because I know you're all parents and some of you have kids in college. Actually, we're heading there. Somebody just got peppered with all of that over the past year, year and a half. Um, I got I got stuff from more I got more stuff from places he contacted than places he didn't. Um, the one place that really peppered us was the University of Arizona, and he had no contact with them, and they were on my email and on his email and, and sending things to the mailbox and so mm -hmm. on. Um, I kind I kind of feel that, that what I saw was not a big advertisement on free college or student loans. Okay. What I saw was you're going to really enjoy it here, and it was more of a more of an experience recruiting that they were doing rather than here's a boatload of free money. Um, at the end of the day, 
I don't like people having information to solicit people, but there is a statute and a law that says that we have to give certain things up. And, and so I think we, we only give those those things up that we have to be, that we have to, and we do so in a minimal way. Uh, if we have to give up an electronic uh, mail address to the Board of Regents, um, I like the fact that it does go through the school. Uh, and again, most of, the, most of the solicitations that you're getting they're, they're not about free money. The free money happens after you apply, after your parents are involved, after there's a, I'm going to use the term you don't like, FAFSA involved. FAFSA. FAFSA. Okay. Um, but, but that's where that starts to come in. And the minute that we filled out uh, the FAFSA for uh, my son, we were inundated by all the Sally May and this whole barrage of, oh, take out this loan against your house so that we can send your kid to school and on and on. <laughs> okay. that, that, that does come, but that comes to my mailbox. I get to look at it. It gets very quickly shredded. <laughs> That's fine. And, and Is that so, your experience, too? Same experience. I did not get the Sally Mae stuff, so they with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a shredder you can borrow when you come. Yes, yes. <laughs> Our daughter received more mail on a daily basis than, than mom and dad did at home. <laughs> as soon as that May 1st is kind of the, the national signing day, if you will, where most schools want you to declare to their, their school for the following school year, that mail has come to an abrupt halt. Um, and she's only receiving mailings from the school that she is enrolled in at this point. Um, the have to online account also once a student graduates and I do not know the date off the top of my head but we do shut that off for that student so it is no longer their account once they're no longer our student and have graduated from us as well. And with the FAFSA, uh, and I know that's a dislike years as well to, to echo John, but you are getting nowhere without your parents sitting down and going through that with you. You're, you're, you're not going to be able to submit it. It's just not something you can do. Oh, I know. I had to fill them out for our kids year after year, and it was a nightmare. My, um, my, my mom reminded me my dad filled out one for me, too, back in the 80s. So, so I, would, I would like to point out that we don't even keep a student, we don't even maintain a student's phone number in our system. We don't have any of them on file, um, nor do we have any of their personal email addresses. So I, That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, so we don't even we don't even collect that data. So we can take then then can we just go through the list? So we need A the student's name, B the student's address, mm -hmm. uh, C the student's telephone listing, we can remove that. D okay. the student's um can, can we back up? Oh sorry. I think we need to possibly reword that to the student's parents' telephone listing if we're releasing that. I don't know if that needs to be on there if we word it that way or if that even well, makes sense at all. We do have the students' phone numbers in synergy if they've given them to us. Some of our students don't live with parents anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's not something we collect as a matter of record as students. No. Sure. Just in synergy. I'm, so the, the question is, is the parent's information directory information? No. No. It's, I think that's not an issue. This is just about the student. Right. In spite if we have the numbers, but we're not releasing them, yeah. so we could remove them from the list of information that we auto would auto release. However, if a student is 18 and if they are emancipated, sure. then that information is their information. That's right. So the challenge you have from a legal perspective is there are some situations where it would be student information versus parent information. And I know that the directory information, although we don't want to be able to do that, we need to make sure we're not putting ourselves in a situation where we are releasing information when we're excluding it, but we're doing it inadvertently, which would be the case with some of our older students at the high school. But those older students could come in and sign, they could sign a release to release their information, and that was the problem. 
that's what we're discussing, right? The, the challenge you have is when we get a request for directory information when a parent, we do have some of the exclusions where certain information not to be, and so those parents' information when we run a query are removed if they said that they don't wish for certain information, their pictures and things like that. Um, but I don't know that we'll be able to differentiate a student who's 18 years old at the high school if they were running that directory information because you'd be pulling it from that parent where that would be the student information at that time would be in the parent information. I don't That's an issue. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question would be that if they're over 18, then that no longer applies. Well, they can direct their own information. Right. But how would you know? Well, by their date of birth. Wouldn't, wouldn't we know that the student is over 18? And wouldn't we know that their parental contact number is the same as theirs? Unless they've changed their contact number from their parents, it would be the same information. So if I remember correctly in FERPA, there's explicit language that if you're 18 and you know you take ownership of all of your you know, student information, but that doesn't just happen automatically. Like you have to be involved as the 18 year old. No, when you're legally 18 and you under FERPA, those rights transfer they to They just you. transfer. By law, when you're 18 yeah. in Arizona, you're an adult and those rights transfer automatically. Well, then got... wouldn't we capture that just by keeping their date of birth? I mean, our systems are pretty sophisticated now, aren't they? I don't know that the date of birth is there, but I don't know when you're looking at that field where they're entering the information. When a student, I could say there are those situations where students are 18 and they come in and they can say, I don't want my parent, and they're removing their parents, and the student becomes, quote, unquote, the parent. That was the part I was talking about. Yeah. The student actually has to come in and remove, does, don't they, the parent. At, even though the rights transfer, the parent can still call on the student unless the student explicitly makes the request to have, they don't want their parent knowing anything. So there has to be some interaction between the student at that point. When they turn 18, if they want to strip their parents from having access to their <coughs> student records. Even though the rights transfer, they have to make that you know, action, they have to... Still out report cards and all of that are right. mailed out to the address that right. the parents had all of right. the same stuff. I don't know, if we're not giving out student phone numbers at this point for anything under directory information, I don't see how it would negative... I think we would have heard if it negatively impacted us, <coughs> either by the, you know, Board of Regents or the military. <coughs> ready to uh, we're still move on to we're only on um, eight C. <laughs> we're still on C. Oh, I, I crossed C out. <laughs> so did I. So did I. But. <laughs> Sorry. Are you ready for D? Yeah. Okay. D? I, I mean, we do not get out the place of. So we can remove place of birth. Can we reword that to say the student's district provided electronic email address? Okay. Did you get that, Terry? Okay. 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 And then F? Yes, we'll keep that, right? G? Yes. H? No. Can we strike that? <coughs> Does a high school student even have a major field study? <coughs> Perhaps if. <laughs> it's in uh, CT, one of the CTE classes, you might say that better. But we don't collect that data the okay. That would be self disclosure okay. I would say that one was added on there whenever, <coughs> two years ago that I referenced, when we had the top 20 dinner where the majority of those seniors would have decided what their major field study is, and there's a pamphlet made for that top 20 dinner. That has changed now where they fill up that information on their own now. So it's not something that we do with these. Okay. I cross that one out. Jenny? Cross that one out. What did you say? 
the one request that I mentioned. Okay. Keep it. L, I understand, is used in sports, so keep it. Specifically wrestling. And yeah. Not the way. yeah. M, I would say keep it. That's in the newspaper all the time. And N, I think we should strike because it's. It's redundant. Yeah. They're requesting the information from right. us, so they know what the last thing is. Okay, anything else? So then, um, as I'm having, uh, it looks as though we're keeping A, B, we're modifying D to just say date of birth, E, we're modifying district provided email, we're keeping F and G, we're keeping K, L, and M. So this would be brought back with just that list of nine. Is that what I understand? Brought back at the next board meeting. Anything else on this item? We're done on any closed discussion. All right, then. So we don't need to vote on this tonight because it's coming back to us next month. We'll bring it back as a revised version that you yeah. can see because it's a regulation and everyone has to come one time once it's revised. Okay. Um, item. I want to second. Second. Okay. Then. So we're done. Closing discussion. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> do we need a do we need a vote to close discussion? We took a vote to, to open it. Item, so we would need a vote. Okay, so go ahead. Tara G and Alador? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. John Haskell? Yes. <coughs> yes. Okay. Item six point ten, Mrs. Asire. Thank you. This um this item is being brought back. It was requested to discuss the use of student cell phone video, particularly uh, how it could possibly be used, as I recall, in um, hearings or in disciplinary action. And so the only place that we really have anything listed on student cell phone video is in this particular policy, JK-R, which is a regulation. And on the top of the second page, the second bullet, uh, talks about the use of electronic devices and that students need to have permission to um, to use to video things at school. Uh, this is really for for formalized settings as opposed to the day-to-day -day stuff that happens. You know, students are allowed to do to have their phones out at lunch and, and so forth. But um, we did get a uh, opinion from our attorney in regard to the use of student video. The students actually make the video that um, there could be a concern. Uh, because there would be more than one minor student that would be portrayed in the educational record. And so I believe I sent back out the second part of that in terms of the FERPA definition. And they talk specifically about um, when the photo is directly related to a student and it's maintained by an educational agency by, um, or by a party acting for the agency. And so those are an and situation. So if the student video is used to um, as evidence for discipline or for a hearing, now it becomes a record that we have to maintain because it was used as evidence so far it does apply in that particular situation. Okay. Um, do we have a motion? Uh, I move we approve 6.10 <coughs> as presented. Thank you. Open discussion? No. no discussion. Discuss it in the motion. Then, I mean, then there will be no vote. Then. I'm sorry? We don't need a vote then if we're just. If we're not making changes, we can actually. Uh, it's already our existing policy. No. Oh. We don't, we don't even need a motion. Oh, gosh, this was me asking to bring this back to the board. Yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I just have questions, so I guess a motion to open this discussion. You. Sorry. Second. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Do you want a second one? Yeah, please. John, Yes, yes, yes? Okay. No, we're just opening. Okay. Um, 
So I, I read this from Tosca, and so here's my question. And she uses the example. A fight breaks out between two students in the cafeteria, right? So what happens when a fight breaks out in the cafeteria? It happens to be caught on tape uh, from a distance, and it proves that one person was defending themselves. But we have the zero tolerance policy, right? Not on the books anymore, but if you get into a fight, you're going to get in trouble. Unless it's self-defense. That's not true. If there is a, kind of a definition for self-defense I mean, in terms of... Yeah. Okay, I haven't seen that definition of self-defense. Do you remember that? Uh, Joe sent it to me. Uh, I won't be able to quote it. Right okay. Now, it is um, when you are in a situation where there is no means of escape. So if, if I were to back you into a corner and coming at you, if, if we pick this corner of the room here, that, that cabinet was not there and you had no reasonable means of escape or in a bathroom stall where something is coming at you, then it is deemed self-defense if you have no means of escape. But if it's more than one person attacking one person and that one person doesn't run and engages, they're going to be in trouble too. This is so fundamentally wrong that we put our kids through this. I just have to say. Um, because, you know, we have this bullying problem, and the reason we have the bullying problem is because the bullies aren't getting their butts beat. I mean, really, that's what it boils down to. And I know that seems like I'm advocating for violence, but I did watch a video that was on Facebook of a young man who was being attacked in this school. And, and it was so wrong that that couldn't be used, you know, that video. It didn't provide the context. Or, I don't remember what the whole backstory was, but the idea that his only option was not to stand his ground and defend himself, was to run because there was, he could run in 47 directions, now we're gonna punish him, seems wrong. Doesn't it? Is it just me? Well, I, I think that these things end up getting handled almost on a case-by-case case basis. Often there is some background or some backstory, uh, something in the, the attacker's history, his discipline record, or hers, um, and, and in the, the other students, and they've been advised. I mean, it, it, they can, we, it can we, be handled. We still, I mean, we contextualize it to a degree, but we still Anytime you have two young men that get into a fist fight and, and, and they're violent confrontations, I, I don't condone fist fighting. But when you get two young men and get in a fist in a fist fight and it happens, mm -hmm. it just does, mm -hmm. we tend to want to at some level <coughs> consequence both of them, whether it's a legal consequence or not, I think we've moved a step away from it. We haven't moved completely away from it. We've moved a step away. I can tell you that that it has been my experience that generally in a fist fight, the district, when they come to discipline hearings, has historically, maybe not as of late, but has historically asked for an equal measure for both parties. We don't contextualize. When you get into a discipline hearing, there's not, well, yeah, but this happened that, precip that precipitated. You're not allowed to talk about the other party. You are allowed to talk about your actions as a student, but not what happened to you, not what precipitated it. If we get our hands tied left, right, and center by the in, in a lot of this and our interpretations of it, and we don't get the chance to actually say, this is what started the fight. Here are the parties involved. And so how do you then contextualize this at all if our discipline process does not, by federal law, allow for contextualization? It just, how, how, do, you, how do you sit there and, and, and even start to put context in when you can't use the videos, you can't uh, mention other parties? We used to have a, have a very simple setup in this, in this country. 
everybody sat down in the principal's office after the fight. You figured out who was right, who was wrong, what was up, what was down, and you met it out the problem. And you both found out working with the custodian. Or you were in more fear because you went home for your, with your dad. You know, I'm afraid of my dad more than I am anything that happens to me at the school. Nowadays, that doesn't work that way. And we wind up with discipline hearings, long-term suspensions, uh, removing kids from the education environment. And, and I would I would venture to guess that while there's no saint in a fight between, between two young men, there's a reason why it happened, and we should be understanding that. And I think one should understand why the fight happened. You can then go back and say, probably should have done this better. Because of that, we're going to go out and do that. We don't get to do it. I think that as we're talking about videos, one of the things is one of the things is um, whether the video is shown in whole or in part, it could be taken out of context. The other thing, as most of you will know, nowadays there are photos, seriously photoshopping photos and videos to do anything. So how do we know if it's a fake video? So I, I think videos have to be treated very, very discerning. So this, I'm trying to, I was trying to go back and remember why I wanted this brought back up in the first place because I think I went down a road that wasn't pertinent to why we, I originally wanted to see it and that was because we were um, uh, discussing that students weren't allowed to use their um, video function on their cell phones at camp, on campus. Is that, was that the context? Um, that is what it says here in this. But I thought that when you asked to bring it back, it was because we weren't able to use the video, like when we were seeing the kids over the fight or a situation that occurred on campus, or something a video. And I think it was because we were installing the surveillance, and my concern is that as adults, we're surveilling the kids, but the kids aren't allowed to use their own videos to... So when we're talking about a video, and I appreciate what you're saying about the doctored videos, because, boy, they're doctoring videos now, AI, videos from one single Facebook uh, profile picture they can turn into a video making you do something that you never did. I just got to see that article I think I might have worded it but anyway. Um, my concern is that we're sending a mixed message about the videos and if a student has a video of a fight that occurred in that day, in that period, I have no concern it's been doctored. There's no time to doctor a, a cell phone video that just occurred, that just happened. Uh, of course, I wouldn't want something that you know was emailed from home a week later. Oh, look at the fight we captured. That's different. But uh, my concern was that we weren't using it because everybody's got their cell phones. And I just feel like that we punish, um, especially boys, um, for what I think has been normal behavior in a lot of ways, that's sometimes the only way to resolve your issues from the beginning of time, you know? That's how men have resolved their issues. And I know there's a big uh, controversy about that. But when we're putting kids out of school, we're certainly not helping that aggressive behavior. Um, and, and if there's kids that are being bullied and uh, fights that are occurring and students uh, are being told that they can't use that video or capture it on video to prove that somebody was defending themselves. Um, I don't know why we would allow them to bring their own devices anyways. I mean, when you think about being that one student who could be exonerated um, by somebody's cell phone video, which everybody has, and your life gets altered a little bit because you get walked out of high school in handcuffs for a fight, that, that can be life altering and I think it deserved you know, the attention to discuss it, for sure. And I've sat through a few uh, discipline hearings where I completely disagreed with the administration's um, recommendation to expel uh, based on fights. And I know that you guys' hands are tied because you're following policy. I get that. And I guess that's what I'm questioning is, you know, all the kind of mixed messages that we're sending. 
we want all these kids to just sit and study and take these tests and you know play nice together but not too nice together and um, not fight and not be normal and if you step out of line you know we're going to involve the police and oh by the way did we just change statute are we mandated now like i know we were policy wise involving the police but didn't something I just happen in this legislative session so. that now we're required <laughs> to do i think it was in there that they have to be and um so anyways so I, if i may um please and I really wasn't expecting necessarily this conversation out of this today, but I do want to share this because I think it's important to know. Uh, they start, students are um, aggressive there. They start as children, as younger children, and at the elementary schools, they handle those in-house. They're not, they're taking in the context. They're using those opportunities to teach kids how to handle conflict. Uh, we don't even bring students forward for extended suspension for fighting until they get to high school. So they have all these opportunities to learn, to have opportunities to intervene, with possible exceptions where somebody's seriously injured at the middle school if it was that serious. But uh, by the time they are freshmen in high school, they should have learned how to resolve conflicts because as adults, we don't get into fistfights to resolve con conflicts. The opportunities for students to become seriously injured, even if they were defending themselves, um, those risks increase as they get older. And then the opportunities um, for other students to become engaged and cause greater harm as students get older, that occurs more frequently at the high school level. So it's not like they've been allowed to do this and all of a sudden we're saying you can't fight anymore. They're, they really have had opportunities to learn how to resolve conflicts throughout. I would also say that our administration has been much better about looking at, uh, I don't know if much better about, I mean, I think they've always looked at the context of the situation, look at the context of the student. Uh, but this past school year, we only had seven fights at the high school that came forward for hearing. And out of those seven, I believe five of the students went back after the hearing. Uh, they went back on and on. Well, I can't even remember the last expulsion hearing we had. Yeah, so, so I can't even remember what we was really last have year. Been, I don't think um, doing a lot to help resolve some of that conflict, okay. and so it, 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 at least from my viewpoint and from personal experiences of my own, um, the consequences of fighting as they get larger and older are much greater than uh, than just. A, a possibility of assistance sharing. And we do need to help our students understand how to function as adults in society because that is not okay. They will get arrested and taken to jail as soon as they turn 18 and get into a fight. So at some point we have to, uh, to accelerate their learning of the consequences. That's, that's my personal bias on it. It's what I've observed over many years in education. Um, I agree with everything that you just said. I also think that there's some things that that's the only way to get the message across. And I think with, when I talk about bullying, I'm not even talking about the physical in-kind bullying anymore. That's not even what I mean. I guess I should state that when I'm talking about it, but I, that's not what I'm talking about because I don't see aggressive little kids, or not little kids, but high schoolers, I should refer to them that way. But, um, you know, young adults, I don't see them like that, but they are online. And, and so when I say bullying, I'm referring to sometimes that's the only way to resolve that kind of um, is a personal interaction because everybody's hiding behind those computers and it is vicious. It is the most disturbing, uh, I, I've read the most disturbing things. Uh, go ahead. To help you understand also, a lot of times it is most of it is social media bullying mm -hmm. and when that's brought to our attention we do bring in all the parties we do try to do conflict resolution with the kids um, have them get together we talk we do do that um, I know that several of the situations that came to the board here in this year it wasn't just a one-day fight it was a situation you know several that had happened we had discussions with them said you know if this happens again, we're going to, you know. So we do try, I mean, I'm a mom of a boy, and I completely understand boys being boys, too. Um, 
but I do know that of the fights we've had this year, four of them that I dealt with had serious medical issues, and then we bring in Officer Earhart for that. But we, we really are that cruel. We do try to meet with the kids, talk with the kids, do conflict resolution, some of that restorative justice with them. Most of the bullying is done on social media, and we do get a lot of that, and we do, we do take it serious. Can I ask a question? I'm sure probably, but um, when uh, does does the uh, police officer look at video that students provide to them? So, if a fight happens on campus, obviously the two that are fighting aren't videoing it. It's, right. it's everybody, and you know, that's, a, that's a quick indicator to us also on a campus of 1,700 plus that something's going on right over there that should not be because there were phones in the air. We do have good kids in our school that do not want these things happening in their school. Within moments, they are down in the office saying, Mr. Becker, Mr. Krieger, Ms. Williams, here's a video. And the only time, the only use that it really is, is to indicate who were the two people fighting. Because sometimes they're in the middle, and they, they know that somebody's coming, or somebody alerts that our security guards are on the way. And then we had something happen and had no clue who it was. So it's to to identify, and then at that point, Officer Earhart is involved, and he goes through his investigation of interviewing witnesses um, that were around at that time that are, that are willing to fill out a witness statement, and obviously doing checks that I don't just select Mr. Mm -hmm. Williams' friends to, to interview at that point, that there's a wide variety of students, sure. and then we go from their witness statements and, and move forward at that point. We, I've never personally brought a student's um, recording of a fight to a hearing um, because there is that piece of when did you start recording this? Did I smack Miss Williams first and then my buddy started recording and this is what's being shared with us so it looks like she attacked me so that we, we do not utilize those videos in, in that sense. It's strictly identification at that point. So, as I recall, the motion is just to discuss this item. Now, are you ready to, to vote on this item, or? Yes, I'm sorry, can I ask one more question? Do, uh, this um, policy describes the not being able to use their electronic uh, instruments during the school day. Um, but I understand that the students are allowed to have their phones out at lunchtime and are they also during passing period? Right. And so does this need to be updated just from that standpoint that it no longer reflects our practice? So, so going back to my statement as well, if a kid brings down a video of a fight so that we can identify, we're not going to persecute a kid that just helps us out to keep our, state, our campus safe. So okay. that, I mean, we do not act in, in that manner by any means. And, and those individuals that do share those things with us, we do not share with anybody who are, are reporting who people are or we're not going to get any reports in the future. Our students are our biggest help when it comes to bullying and with fights on campus um, because there are more of them. They know what's going on. Um, just like Ms. Williams said, when and I agree 100% if we could get rid of social media, I, I don't know that we'd have bullying uh, at all. I mean, there, there'd be very small, rare. Very rare. Um, when that takes place and we see the lewd things that are said and we pull all those parties together, we obviously do our end of things. And then if we see fit, we also bring Officer Earhart in to um, counsel them on you no know, more contact with each other. If this continues, your response is, please do not contact me anymore. And then if that happens and there's continued contact, he explains the harassment statute to them as well and goes through that. So it, it's a pretty thorough process, and then that's documented so that if they go down to the skate park at that time, um, it's not a police record, it's an info report that if they go down to the police or the skate park or the movie theater and then they get in a fight and the, the officer does his job down there, he can say, on 1220 you were in Mr. Becker's office with Officer Earhart, and there is context for those individuals um, to be able to see that they're this isn't just something that just happened as well. 
Okay. Well, that just opened up a whole other can of worms. I was just breaking that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just back to the statement for a moment. It does actually say it's, um, that they can't use it unless it's been authorized by the school administrator. So since the administrator allows them to have it out at lunchtime, then that's considered authorized by the school administrator. So, so we're fine with the way it's yeah, I think we're fine with the way it's written. So did you want to say anything else? Oh, that no, no, I'm not going to open that can of worms, but... We can open it another time. It's open it another time. I have to understand what I just heard better. Yeah. So. Yeah. There is a police report, and it's, it's a record, and it really has nothing to do with the school again at that point, but that's how it all comes together. I couldn't hear a lot of what was said, so... Okay. Well, I don't want to look at the staff. I want to look at what just passed legislatively, too, because I remember something about it being mandated. Well now did you want to um, go ahead and vote on I, I would move it be close discussion. Okay. okay. And then it would be brought up at the next board meeting. Only if there are changes. Only if there are changes. So we're we're not so we're fine with no changes. Okay then. All right. I second <laughs> so we don't need to vote, right? No, we do. Sorry. <laughs> Moving ahead. Did you vote last time? Yeah. Did Cole Cohen? Yes. Sean Mastin? Yes. Archie Ann Alliar? Yes. Kathy Box. Yes. Thank you. All right. We're moving on to 6.11. Mrs. Asayo. Thank you. This was a um, third policy Mrs. Cohen requested that we brought back and uh, for discussion. And this is the policy on open uh, and closed campus. Uh, I will entertain a motion that we discuss of this. So. Okay, and we have second. a second. Okay, Mrs. Cohen. And Mrs. Cohen, since you were the one who brought this up, would you like to? Um, oh, I got the numbers. Yeah, well, because I, I thought, I think that now I'm remembering, it was kind of the context of are we treating our kids like adults or are we treating them like kids? And I think that was part of it. But anyways. The open closed campus, and I know that horrified everybody, I think I got numbers on that. And it looks like a majority of our seniors already have four period days anyway. So um, I think this is really a non-issue. Okay. But that was my curiosity because, you know, the schools, of course things change, I realize things change, but it's such a lockdown now. Everything's just so locked down. Um, I had open campus, we walked on and off campus. You know, you don't go to school, you you don't graduate. <laughs> that was kind of the thing. But so, anyways, uh, but a majority of our seniors are already off campus by noon every day, so it really doesn't mean anything yeah. beyond that. Yeah. So that's good. Okay. Glad that they're so smart they can have a four period day, and we still get paid for a full time student, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So, we move and close discussion. Second. Okay. Um, is this funny? John Gaskin? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Martina Allier? Yes. <coughs> yes. That was our first non item. And that was good. Do it again. <laughs> uh, 6.12, Mrs. Walter. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended that the governing board approve the renewal of the memorandum of understanding for Waycock Head Start Preschool Classroom Facilities, uses to Nautilus Elementary or Grande and have a sit by elementary schools. The district has identified the need and value of providing quality preschool assistance for at-risk children, particularly those far from low-income families within our community. This agreement is being revised at this time to include the relocation of one of the current two Head Start classrooms from Nautilus Elementary School to have a sit by elementary school. This would increase access for eligible low-income families to quality preschool intervention at Nautilus Elementary School, Havasupai Elementary School, and Warp Grande Elementary School, in addition to the Pima Head Start site. Approval of the renewal of the Memorandum of Understanding will serve for a period of five years with option of termination within three months for the notification. A copy of the agreement has been reviewed by legal and is attached to this item for boards of review. <coughs> Um, do I have a motion to? I move we approve 6.12 as presented. Second. Mrs. Allier? Yes. Mrs. Allier, did you want to second? 
think I do have a second. Oh, I say. Oh, she seconds it. Okay. So, is there any discussion? Just to get the board a little bit of understanding, <clears throat> the enrollment at Nautilus is growing, and we have the two classrooms. And because of the increased student enrollment, we're moving one. And the reality is, we may be transitioning both classrooms to have a supply based on enrollment where they have more capacity. Okay. So, comment the question. This is funny. Archana Alia? Yes. Cole Cohen? No. John Mastin? Yes. John Kathy Cox? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, item 6.13, Mrs. Sire. Okay. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended that the board approve the first presentation of the revised policies listed below. These policies are brought forward as a bundle because they have technical changes as a result of changes in the law. And of course, the board always has opportunities to revise those. So the policies are as follows. First policy is DIE, audits and financial monitoring. The law had required us to change auditors every three years and then the legislation discovered that there weren't enough auditors for school districts to do so and so they have uh, taken that out of the policy so this is one that we revised last year and we're revising again this year to remove that language the second policy is family life education um, i did spend some time going through the statute to make sure that the language of our policy is aligned uh, there is there was a question that came up from a board member on page two of three under the content and the uh, the word uh, in the first paragraph under content of instruction k-12a it says deviant and that is the correct word for that uh, the language that has been removed or is on page five of that policy under number five um, Promote and honor, promote, honor, and respect for monogamous heterosexual marriage has been removed. And then under the HIV education, the language nothing shall be included that promotes a homosexual lifestyle, portrays homosexuality as a positive alternative lifestyle, or suggests that some methods are safe methods of homosexual sex. Those lines have been redacted as a well for the policy. And that, are, that is the only change to these. To that particular policy. The next one is the admission of resident students. And this is, uh, again, we are required to show student residency annually as well as any time a student moves. And so the language, which is an update and has been the case for homeless per federal law, is that proof of residency is not required for homeless students. So that has been added on page seven. And then on the um, Residency verification, the United States passport has been deleted and a valid Arizona Address Confidentiality Program authorization card uh, has replaced the passport there. There's also new language that the public school shall accept the substitute address as the address of record and shall verify student enrollment eligibility through the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State shall facilitate the transfer of student records from one school to another. And then finally, um, off-base military housing rental agreements can also be used for residents. So, are there any major changes per statute? Okay. Is there anything else that you want to add? Um, no, the forms are revised, and then um, as we go on, the next policy is on page 12. This is the uh, tuition or admission for non-resident students. And again, this is uh, the inf same information that was on that policy was um, about homeless students. And then again, the, the uh, using the passport and the military housing. On this particular one, the entire forms have changed. So you'll notice in the exhibits, one of them is completely crossed out and then reformatted. And then on page 20 is the public's right to know freedom of information. And this is um, adding language for public record, defining what a public record is, and then uh, identifies that the uh, superintendent receives those requests for public records. 
And then finally, it, it strengthens the language that we shall provide access to public records, but we can charge for those copies. And there's some additional information that has been added regarding commercial purposes. So this is, again, all uh, as relation to statute changes. So then we have five different policy advisories that we're taking a look at. Um, any suggestion of how we go about discussing each one? Um, I, we'll, I make a motion that we approve 6.13 as presented, but that we break them up for the second reading. For the second reading, okay. So how how do you how would you like those broken up for the second reading then? Individually each of them? And are there any, um, did you want to have any discussion about possible changes? Okay, so I'm, I made the motion. Yes. Yeah. All right. Can we break them up into two, five separate items of agenda for this? For next meeting. Uh -huh. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any discussion about that? All right. I think that'll, that'll work. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, so the first thing that I want to mention is the last policy, the Public Right to Know Freedom of Information Act. There's no statute cited. So it's one thing for the legislature to go and constantly change the rules, but now we've got to worry about ASBA coming in and changing the rules. For what purpose? There was no legislative change, so that's concerning for me. I don't know why they sent this out. You know, I don't have that advisory in front of me. I apologize for that. It could be, this is a regulation, it could be on the actual uh, policy. That the policy is cited, that, that, that the legislation is cited. So we don't have citations on regulations. But there was no legislative action taken on public record requests other than medical records. And I read through all that and it didn't pertain to even okay. a school setting. So I don't know what this is about. But I would be interested if there's any information on why they're pushing that out. Okay. So I need to go back and read that advisory. My apologies. All right, then, Mrs. Fleming. Um, no, oh, something else, Mr. Benson? Are we still uh, having the uh, State Board of Education uh, discussing uh, the uh, regulation on uh, family life education? So I actually went to that website and downloaded it. They actually adopted the regulation, and it was approved on May 20th, 2019. So whether it will reappear on an agenda, I don't know. But at this point in time, the board did, in fact, adopt the regulation. It's been reopened. It's, it's going to be reopened. It's been reopened. It's, it's still adopted until they re-adopt right. re re it. So... It's on the agenda for the 24th to um, have that discussed. You know, I just want to say I won't belabor this because it's the first reading, reading, but the idea that removing this from statute, um, you know, I heard our superintendent speaking about this, and then I also heard Kathy Harrod uh, from the uh, Center for Arizona Policy, which is a very socially conservative group, basically agreeing that this language that was removed um, about promoting, honoring, and respecting respect for monogamous heterosexual marriage is an antiquated old idea <coughs> that needed to be kicked to the dustbin. And I thought to myself, here we are in all this uh, diversity, inclusion, um, and we're singling out heterosexual uh, monogamous relationships is somehow bad that we need to strike that it kind of feels like our world is kind of turned upside down a little bit um, so I'll be at the State Board of Ed on the 24th right now for that. And this is actually the um, that particular language is under 15-716 of Arizona Revised statute. statute and I actually pulled this up on the 12th and it had not been removed from the statute I just looked language. at it and it was still there right so, and, and that's the other thing, you know, this all went down before they started the budget talks. This was all part of a backroom deal. Uh, the governor signed it, you know, within hours of the legislature pushing it through. And we just need to be really careful about what we're, what we're saying here. 
you know, we're going to say that everything else is normal except for a monogamous heterosexual marriage. I mean, that's where we're headed. That's what the push is. And it's just really wrong um, to send that message out to our kids. Our kids struggle as it is uh, with everything that's being foisted on them. And then to make this the, the most pressing issue of the legislature and the ADE uh, kind of study. And uh, just in case anybody wants to do additional reading before the second read, um, uh, we have uh, all of our sex ed, and I'm so thrilled our district does not have an actual sex ed policy because we shouldn't. That is totally for the family, in my opinion, to discuss. But a lot of districts in Arizona have an actual policy. Uh, we don't. Am I correct? Well, we have a policy for um, family life education. Well, we don't have a policy. We have the generic right. uh, Arizona School Board Association policy. Yes. But that's not a sex ed policy, and there's a difference. Am I correct? A sex ed policy requires us to have a committee, requires right. us to go through curriculum, adopt curriculum. We don't have that. Yeah, our, our policy is that language. And so if we, if we decide to offer it, right. we would have to do all of those things. That's what I mean by we yes. don't have one, because yes. we haven't had to go through all that yet. And I think that's a great thing. I mean, that's fantastic, because there's some school districts that are now going to go through just unbelievable pain over this subject. But I will tell you, uh, and Marcia Cox and I have both been doing a lot of research, and she ordered this book, and I'm ordering it too. It, our whole sex ed in this country from the early 70s on has been predicated and built on uh, Alfred Kinsey's uh, research, his science. And Planned Parenthood, same thing. I mean, they all followed this science, and it's the sexual behavior in the human male. I mean, I think it was uh, published in 48. And that's what all sex ed was built on, is this research. And what's so disturbing, and what we're going to go talk to the State Board of Ed about on Monday, is that Chapter 5 was completely glossed over in this book. And it's all about, um, uh, in the Chapter 5, Table 34, is all about all the minors, 5 months to 10 years old, timed in a 24-hour period about how many orgasms these five-month-old, 11-month-old, two-year-old, four-year-old, nine-year-old, ten-year-old could achieve in a 24-hour period with a pedophile, in my opinion, molesting them. And this is what our sex ed was built on, just so everybody's real clear about what we're about to discuss in this state. So it's very disturbing research to do. Um, and I like to research, but not this stuff. But anyways, so i just be happy to share um, any research that I have with anybody interested in that deep, dark dive, because that's what it is. It's a deep, dark dive. And it's about to be foist on our entire state with the removal of that promote, honor, and respect for monogamous heterosexual marriage. So. Well, um, let me just give you a little food for thought. Okay. I, I don't want to dis discuss I just want to give you a little food for thought. If a teacher teaches this material were to check the district policy, that would be really a good thing. And I hope all of them do because it is you know, it's touchy, it's political. I mean, they, they need to really know what our policy is. And when they come to that statement, uh, promote honor and respect for monogamous heterosexual marriage, then what you have is, from the teacher's viewpoint, the, the teacher needs for every student in that class to feel accepted and liked, whether the teacher agrees with things going on or what does, it doesn't matter. Of course. So, and because things have changed so much in the last few years, for, for the teacher to stand up and, and say, this is you know, I'm promoting this, it's what we need to do, and to have students there think, oh my gosh, if my teacher only knew, you know, she, he wouldn't like me, she wouldn't like me, that, and, and you know, that that's, I, I think that's probably why this statement has been deleted, that 
the teacher would now be expected, with the statement included, to promote to promote this uh, in, in the classroom. And I, I, don't, I think teachers would be very uncomfortable knowing that they now have got gay students in the classroom and that they don't want to alienate those kids. They don't want Did you feel uncomfortable in the classroom? Did you feel pressure to promote respect for mon monogamous heterosexual marriage? No, because that was never yeah. an issue that I even was aware But that's my point. Yeah. It's not an issue. Well, it, it is if you know you have gay students Why? in your class. Does that language make you disrespect gay students? No, it doesn't make me disrespect. Or it any makes teacher. The, it makes the students who are gay uncomfortable. Only because adults are telling them to be uncomfortable about it. See, if we're treating everybody with respect, regardless of their skin color or their gender or their sexual preference or any of the other identity politic categories that we can come up with, then we don't have all these issues. But the amount of money and time that we're spending on these very personal issues in a school setting, when we have, you know, we need to be worried about reading and writing and getting along with each other, it's obscene and absurd. And nobody's advocating for treating, not on, not from my perspective, and that hasn't been my experience. You know, I know I'm not that old, but from a very young age, I've been surrounded by people that had different sexual preferences. They were people to be admired in that, you know, they were higher up the, the corporate ladder than I was. They were very respected people. Um, you know, there was never this issue about we need to create special education so we can train people well, on how word, to be respectful. Well, the word promote is pretty Well, that's how you strong. continue a culture. You know, you, you can only continue a culture when you have people procreating. And there's all this talk about um, everything that has not, that doesn't support procreating. So yes, we, we talk about diversity, but we seem to be cutting out that population of people that are um, that believe in the Bible, that are Christians, that want to procreate, that don't want to see abortion, they would rather see uh, adoption or whatever. We are carving that section and deeming that, that, in our culture, in our society. Well, I, I know in our school district, and I, I check with Mrs. Mayors to see what happens, because this is where this is taught, it's at, in the PE department, still in the second room, is, and she said, we just, abstinence, 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 that's, that's what we promote, and she said. Well, let me tell you what concerns me. Okay. I, don't, I don't like tinkering with this. I think the legislature overstepped, and I think they're overstepping again. Um, we're promoting one way or another, and what we should be teaching is we should be teaching reproductive health. That's really what sex education should be, is this is how it happens, this is the reproductive health part of it, and, and we should be done with it, and we shouldn't have a lifestyle in any of this. What goes on between consenting adults in a bedroom, so the conservative at the table, is nobody's business. So are you, so then? I, I think that we could completely rewrite this and, and say, you know what? This is what we actually do in, in, in our case. I, I, I respect the fact that we've had a statute and, and, and up the flagpole and down the flagpole and left and sideways and all over God's green earth. But regardless of your sexual orientation, it should be appropriate to the grade level, it should be medically accurate, it should promote abstinence, it should discourage drug use, and it should dispel the myths regarding the transmission of, of HIV. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. And that's no, where we, we should come together. We can't all agree on that. Okay, what can we agree on? First of all, be medically accurate. The medical accuracy is based on this crap. That's what it's based on. Okay. So no, it's not, this is not, none of this is okay. But, but are we teaching human sexuality or are we teaching reproductive health? Well, we're teaching sexuality. First of all, the new standards are now called, they're not called sex ed standards, they're called sexuality standards. That's different. And so I think that it's good that we didn't have a policy here. My fight isn't with anybody in the district. It's what we're about to do in our state. Right. And 
This has been promoted since the, er since the early 70s. We've all gone through it. The idea that our kids aren't going to know about HIV AIDS or the plethora of STDs that they can catch uh, by having sex is ridiculous. Have you seen what these kids watch on TV? Like they know how it happens now. It's not like it was mm -hmm. when we were in school. You know what I mean? Where you're, that's the only way you're gonna get the education is if your teacher tells you. They have it all right here. I mean, we can send them to the CDC as part of our health class. They can look up all the information that they want. But this is wrong. And I'm glad we don't have a policy. And I hope we keep it that way in this district. So um, let's go ahead and call for, for the vote, and then all of these items will. Are there other questions on any of the other policies? Um, no, the last one and this one, I think. And we still need to come up again. Mm -hmm. Next month. Uh -huh. Second reading. A separate agenda items. Okay. Go ahead. Call Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank Carl Nassen? Yes. Okay. Or Janet Elliott? Yes. Kevin Cox? Yes. Mr. Murray? 6.14. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the governing board approve and sign a borrowing request to be forwarded to the Mojave County Treasurer along with the resolution authorizing, authorizing the request. The Mojave County Treasurer has requested the governing board approve and sign a borrowing request to Wells Fargo Bank for a credit line in the amount of $1 million. This request replaces the letter of declaration approved by the governing board in past years. It is not anticipated the district will be required to borrow funds from Wells Fargo. However, this paperwork must be in place uh, should that become a necessity. And also attached is a resolution and the board author of the board authorizing the borrowing request and both documents have been reviewed and approved by legal counsel. I, I move we approve 6.14 as presented. Second. And this is just for, <coughs> this is LAR's understanding. This is basically housekeeping. If the county wasn't able to pay us for a period of time, we would have money then to borrow. Correct. This would allow us to continue to um, pay, pay the, these vouchers to continue to pay our expenses and obligations. And have we ever used the line of credit? Not to my knowledge. Not every school district in Mojave County can say that. Mrs. Cunningham? John Maston? Yes. Our Janet Elliott? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. And Kathy Cox? Yes. Mr. Murray, item 6.15. Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended the board approve the vouchers for April and May of 2019, as well as student activity funds, grades K through 12 for the month of April, and the auxiliary funds for each of the school sites and district office. Motion. So moved. Second. Okay, Mrs. Fleming. Tom Aston? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Archana O'Leary? Yes. Kathy Fox? Yes. Now we don't have any informational reports in our agenda, uh, our board packet, but do you have anything you'd like to add? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I actually did want to, uh, again, highlight uh, our gifts to our schools, and this is still not the complete list for 18-19, for 18 because we just received something from Rotary, but uh, for this school year, we've already had over $203,000 worth of donations to our district. And I think it's important to understand that these are in addition to tax credit donations and in addition to student fundraising and all of that. These are other gifts and donations, which uh, is amazing how giving our community is. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, I also wanted to share, I know I sent out an email, but I would like to again say it publicly that uh, our bond rating was reevaluated and Moody's put out a press release yesterday. We were upgraded from a double A3 to a double A2 bond rating, which is an amazing feat because they don't often upgrade a bond rating like that. Um, 
it's significant to have that happen. And part of that is for the health of the community, but a major part of that is because of the physical health of the district. And so I would like to compliment Mr. Murray and his team for ensuring our fiscal health and helping us to achieve that amazing bond rating. And then I also would like to thank all of the people who are who participated over the last several weeks in training. We did our EL English Language Arts Essential Standards work week, work on uh, the last week of May. We had I think it was about 55 people who were working on those standards. We identified essential standards for our parents for each of our grade levels, and are working on some additional things that we bring to the board for purchases. And then. Uh, it not, not being presumptuous, uh, we are going to be bringing forward Singapore math to the board as a recommendation for adoption at the July 8th meeting. Uh, we did go ahead and do the Singapore math training, and that was not to presume board approval, but because we felt that uh, for our staff, it was, it was critically important for them to have time over the summer to reflect and to plan. But it was amazing mathematics content training. And so regardless of the curriculum, I believe personally and for those who attended that, it was very valuable what they learned about mathematics. And so all but 25 of our elementary teachers were trained. And we're, we'll have a second training, or actually it's a fourth training, uh, at, toward the end of July, to, or towards the middle of July, to pick up those teachers who were unable to be present for the trainings. So there's been a lot of work done by Mr. Gardner's team particularly on facilitating and coordinating all of this work in the area of curriculum. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Congratulations to you and the district for accomplishing um, I wanted to ask Ms. Triasi, as, um, do you want to give us a report on your future problem solving students? In case um, yes, our students competed um, in Arizona and they won the Arizona level, and then they went to Boston, and they are ninth in the world. So we were very, very proud of them. And that's the first time we've ever sent a team to Canada. Well, it, the amazing part of it is this team, it was their first year competing, and the person that Mrs. Haggis was working with said, your team is outstanding, they should go to the next level. And so they, she did take them to the next level, not anticipating they would place at all, and, she said at the final awards assembly, they put the numbers up because they were coded with a number. And she said the girls looked and they were at the top ten and they were they were pleasantly shocked that they had um, done so well for their very first time competing in the competition. And these were sixth graders? And sixth graders in the fifth, sixth gifted program. Maybe a couple, a couple of I happened to watch her teach that unit for one whole day and I it was, it was just grinding things the kids were, were asked and required to do. I thought, oh my gosh, these, these are kids, can they really do this? But they were taking it very well, seriously. Well, they got to network with children from all over the world oh, at the competition. Super. So it was an oh, outstanding experience for them. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Anything else? Any other board members? Do you have anything? No? All right, thank you. Well, I guess we come to the end. Um, if there's no call to the public. Alright, we moved on. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. It's a swimming. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Mark Chandler Elliott? Yes. John Baston? Yes. Kathy Fox? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>